wife and I decided together that we wouldn't actually retire in Switzerland, that we'd come back to the UK, partly of course because our two sons were of an age where marriage and the possibility of grandchildren uh, was becoming real. And so we decided that we would come back to England. What would we do? My thought was, well, I've been lecturing and doing experiments with all of these ideas about trying to increase diversity in the field. Let's actually try it <laughs> for real. And let's buy a small farm and see if we can do these things. And if we can buy the small farm somewhere which is a bit difficult to find in the rural east of England, then uh, if it doesn't work, nobody will ever see <laughs> or know. <laughs> uh, no, that wasn't really the total reason at all. But anyway, we bought this small property while we were still in Switzerland and uh, we planned together an agroforestry layout which was quite tricky because there was no advice available at that time. Nobody was doing it. Only one or two people, certainly in this country, were beginning to think about it. There was a, a national silver arable and silver pastoral experiment starting. That was almost laughable in one sense, in that the people who were enthusiastic about starting it managed to get some grant funding for this extremely long-term uh, development. They were funded for three years, you know, which is about enough time to actually plan things out and plant something. But there was no funding to uh, look after the experiments or develop them properly afterwards. So, based on very little information, we started to have a, a go at planning this. We actually were able to plant the whole thing, or pretty well the whole thing, in 1994. Uh, while we were still living in Switzerland, we, um, I managed to come across a, a lecturer at an agricultural college which has since disappeared, like many uh, of these things. He was one of the, I think, only two, possibly three people who were really lecturing or talking about agroforestry in the academic world. And when he heard uh, what we were doing, he was very eager to get his students to come across and help. So we had two coachloads of students came in the spring of 1994. We had, we'd organised, bought all the trees, made all the plans, and uh, they all arrived with spades and so on. And we had a very exciting time for two days and got the whole thing planted, which was uh, extraordinary. At that stage, the area around here was just like all the other farms. And uh, it was, well, we had contract wheat growing. And so we could just see uh, the tops of the little plastic shelters for the trees uh, just above the wheat crop. And that was the, the only sign of anything happening at that stage. Whereas now, of course, uh, as you've already seen, we have mature trees. And of course, the trees dominate the, the scene. And we came back from Switzerland in 1997 to live full time uh, on the farm here uh, and develop the system. Uh, which was very exciting, very enjoyable, and we planted more, bought a bit more land, planted more trees. But the main part was planted 1994-1995. So, what I'd realised, uh, becoming more involved with organic agriculture, and particularly then working with what was called Elm Farm Research Centre, is now the Organic Research Centre, that although the variety of mixtures were really rather good in terms of disease control, that under the conditions of organic farming, there's much more variation in the whole system than conventional farming using monocultures. 
So we need much more than variety mixtures which just bring in some disease resistance genes. We need a whole diversity of genes to deal with all sorts of differences in soil type, uh, availability of fertilizer or non-availability of fertilizer and so on and the mixed farming systems anyway. So it had struck me from some looking at some of the literature that a development that had started in the 1920s in California looked as if it might be uh, the real answer and that was programmed to develop composite cross populations. Now the basic idea there is it's basically quite simple but actually quite complicated in fact. The idea is to take a number of varieties with very very different qualities, characters, genes, combinations of genes and then intercross them in all combinations and I mean you do that physically with forceps and scissors and bags and so on. So it, it's a, in a sense an artificial process in just the same way that breeders do in conventional plant breeding. But having got to the F2 and F3 generation when all the plants start to segregate from the crosses then it's very different. In conventional breeding what happens is that the breeders will start selecting what they think are going to be the winning lines, the new varieties of the future. They will select those very hard right from the very beginning. So for example I remember at the Plant Breeding Institute the breeders there would have an F2 population in the field which if you stretch it out in a long line was about up to uh, 30, 40 kilometers long, but they would only save a handful of plants effectively out of that long line. You know, the ones that met every single criteria in the breeder's mind as to how the next new variety should look. What we did was entirely the opposite with these composite cross populations is that having made all these crosses, when they started to segregate in the field in the same way that the conventional ones did, we then stopped doing anything at all. And we left the whole business of selection on those populations in effect to nature. In other words, we said, right you populations, you will adapt yourselves to the local conditions. So the way that works, and you can show it very easily in uh, simple genetic models, we produced crops which were immensely, and I do mean immensely, diverse. Where you could say that every single plant in the field is actually genetically different from every other. So there's a huge reservoir of genetic diversity. So this ought to help in relation to all of the kind of variables in the environment that a crop has to face. And indeed it does, we've been able to show that. Uh, I mean we've been working with these populations now since they were first made in 2001. And they've been grown in various European countries as well as here. And all of the people who've been doing trials with them and watching how they react to the environment have all come to the same conclusion that having this immense diversity means that the crops that are produced are highly resilient. It doesn't matter what the environment throws at them, they will survive. They may not produce fantastic outstanding yields, but you know they will go on producing yields, whatever. And of course, this is not surprising at all. I mean, this is the basis of evolution. This is how wheat and other cereals, how they evolved anyway. You know, by being uh, extremely successful at generating diversity and the bits of the diversity that work can multiply very fast. 
you know, this is what you know, basic Darwinism, this is what Darwin showed. So that's been very exciting. What we came up against, and I knew we were going to come up against it, was that because the monoculture approach has <coughs> been used on a very large scale all around the world, it had built up around itself a whole legislative structure for how these monoculture varieties should be produced and regarded. And that didn't, as it were, think about the idea that there might be populations of very diverse material. By omission, in a sense, it had become illegal to market populations, which is nonsense in evolutionary terms. So we had to take the case to Brussels and say, look, this is very important in relation to or potentially very important in relation to future agriculture, of having the diversity to deal with all the problems that crops have to face, and particularly, of course, with the long-term projection of climate change. We need to change the legislation to allow these things to be grown. And fortunately, the people in Brussels saw that argument and agreed, and so we got what's called a, a temporary marketing experiment, uh, which is now extended through to 2021. So what's happening is that uh, we can now grow these populations legally, market them, and this gives us a time to see whether there are any problems with this kind of procedure, and perhaps more importantly, what we do about marketing this very uh, mixed material. And we've been very fortunate there in that through the company Hodmadods, which uh, is a local company uh, very interested in this kind of approach, they introduced us to Kimberly Bell, who has uh, a business in Nottingham in the middle of the country. She is a very skilled artisanal baker and she became very interested in this whole story of the need for diversity and the problem that monoculture is useful for kind of industry, large-scale industry, baking. But of course, populations are just not feasible in those sorts of processes. So Kimberly set about using her great skill and energy in trying to see whether she could make really decent bread out of the populations. And in fact, she produced the most wonderful sourdough artisanal bread from the population we call the YQ. And she is very interested in developing this further, and so are we. And what we're trying to do now is to develop small hubs where a local organic farmer who's prepared to grow the populations and a local miller who's able to produce wholemeal flour, a local artisanal baker who's able to follow on or develop from Kimberley's methods that she's using. So really trying to decentralize the whole process and get local people involved in the whole business. The problem is, because we've moved away from that kind of approach, which used to be common everywhere, you know, the local baker, the butcher, the, uh, the sawmill, all of these things used to be in every village. We've lost practically all of that now. So we have to somehow, I think, re-establish it in order to, one could almost say, in order to make life worth living. <laughs> um, and to produce, ideally, a very wide range of uh, different crops going through different processes, all for local consumption. To make that happen is going to be difficult, time-consuming, and, of course, the problem is that bits of it will be more easy to do than others. 
So getting the, the timing right is going to be difficult. But I think there are a lot of young people who would like to be involved in small-scale farming, family farming or group farming, and to produce these things locally and to give more diversity of food and life and living to local communities. And I think we need to, my feeling is we need to encourage it. And of course that's where, you know, I've just been talking about the cereals, but that's where the agroforestry comes in, in the sense that the agroforestry can be a way of growing a very large number of different crops together in a small uh, area in order to provide that diversity for local businesses and local food consumption and local money system, if you like, um, which I think is a much safer, more resilient kind of way of doing things than some of the sorts of things we are seeing or have seen in, in the recent past.